His syndicate is enormously wealthy, disciplined, and sophisticated. He allegedly made billions per year, flooding entire countries with his products. This allowed him to live a lavish life, full of opulence and luxury. He made so much money that he once lost 66 million in one night at the casino and wasn't even bothered about it. Certain media outlets have said that he was a bigger player than El Chapo and Pablo Escobar. If that's all true, what was he doing alone at an airport in the Netherlands? This is the story of Tse Shi Lop. Tse Shi Lop was born in 1963 in the Chinese city of Guangzhou. Later on, Tse moved from Guangzhou to Hong Kong, where he would become part of the triad called Big Circle Boys, or the Big Circle Gang. A triad once formed by former members of the Red Guards, a paramilitary group established by Mao Zedong. The name Big Circle Gang allegedly came from a circle drawing on a map that indicated in which part of China they operated. The Big Circle Boys rapidly spread across Canadian cities, and in 1988, Se followed suit at age 25 and moved to Canada as well. He started living in Toronto, and together with the gang, he focused on bringing in large shipments of heroin into the United States. In October 1997, Tse Shilop's life took a drastic turn. He frequently traveled back to Hong Kong for business. Despite always operating under the radar, their business was growing so fast that they caught the eye of law enforcement in the United States. Tse and the rest of the gang were held responsible for the flood of heroin into the country. The authorities in Hong Kong arrested Tse Shilop, as per request of the United States, and immediately extradited him. Tse was accused of large-scale drug smuggling in the United States, and all signs pointed towards him getting a life sentence. But then, totally unexpected, he managed to get sentenced to just nine years in prison. Tse had said in court that he had learned his lesson and deeply regretted his actions. He shared his future plans that he wanted to open a restaurant and stay on the right side of the law again for the rest of his life. He also went on to say that he had to take care of his elderly parents and a sick child, thus could not afford to be in jail for life and begged for a lenient sentence. Whether he spoke the truth or not, it most definitely helped him with the sentencing. Nine years for such large drug smuggling in the United States is unheard of. If he truly regretted, his actions were very questionable. After serving nine years, Tse was released in 2006 from the federal prison in Elkton, Ohio. He returns to Canada where he served another four years of supervised probation with regular check-ins and other mandatory rules he had to follow. Tse followed all the rules and seemed to be on the right path again. A year after he finished his supervised probation, Tse registered a new company in Hong Kong under his wife's name in 2011. The company was named China Peace Investment Group Company Limited. The China Peace Investment Group was supposed to be a group of investors who would invest their funds into real estate, the financial markets, and more mainly Hong Kong. However, the American DEA discovered something completely different. The company was nothing more than a cover-up. They had discovered that Tse was involved in smuggling again, and interestingly enough, he did not pick up where he left off in 1997. He became much bigger than before. So much for learning his lesson. Tse became the head of his own syndicates and managed to create an alliance with several other different Chinese triads, such as the 14K, Wung Xing Wu, and Sun Yi On. All these triads essentially worked for Tse. His syndicate stood at the top of it all. It is said that he even managed to reconcile between notorious rival triads, showing them that working together would be more beneficial than staying each other's enemies. Tse's organization became known as the Sam Gore Syndicate, or The Company. Tse knew that operating in absolute silence was the best. Feuds led to unwanted attention, and attention was bad for business. He made them realize that the pie was big enough for everyone to make a lot of money, and he was not wrong. Tse's organization sold heroin and ketamine by the masses, although his real moneymaker had always been the highly addictive drug meth. His preferred method of smuggling was always between packets of tea. Part of him becoming such a big player was his professional business model, Tse's production line might be a prime example of how to produce high-quality drugs on a large scale. Hidden in the valley of Myanmar's Shan State, in the heart of Southeast Asia's Golden Triangle, the syndicates produced high-quality amphetamine in so-called super labs. Perfectly set up labs that ensured maximum efficiency to produce as fast and as much as possible. 
Another compelling fact about his business model is that he guaranteed free replacements at no extra cost or deposits. If one of his deliveries was intercepted by police, customs, or if a shipment had gotten stolen with proof, this offer was irresistible and brought in a lot of buyers. Though this policy would also bring him in trouble, it put him on the radar of the police without having a clue. Tse was flooding the Australian market with his drugs. In 2011, Australian police officers arrested a group of Australians importing heroin and meth into the country. It was only a small bust, so police decided not to arrest them and instead put them under surveillance, tapping their phones and tracking their moves in the hopes of finding clues that led them higher up the ladder. The group's shipments kept getting intercepted, which led to them constantly asking for replacement shipments from the syndicate. Even though the policy was still in place, the syndicates got fed up with this group, as many other Australian shipments went fine. In 2013, the leader of the Australian group was summoned to Hong Kong to explain himself. Australian police informed their Hong Kong counterparts of this man who they were observing. Hong Kong police took over the surveillance and spotted the man meeting up with none other than Sei Chi Lop himself. This put him immediately on the radar of Hong Kong authorities. Why did he meet with an Australian drug smuggler? They started observing Tse and saw he was a big spender, living in luxury, moving with an army of personal security often made up of at least eight professional Thai kickboxers who were often rotated as part of his safety protocol. It is important to note that at this point, Tse Shi Lop was totally unknown to them and Hong Kong authorities did not know about the magnitude of his business. He would go on to host lavish birthday parties each year at expensive resorts and five-star hotels, flying his family and entourage over in private jets. He once brought his family and entire entourage over to Thailand for a full month in a luxury resort. Tse could always be seen working though, often on his phone texting and calling, giving orders. If there's anything that Tse loved more than living in luxury, it was gambling. You've probably heard of the term high roller before. Tse Shilop was the true definition of a high roller. He would frequently go on gambling sprees, where he would not be betting thousands or tens of thousands for that matter. Tse betted millions upon millions. An investigator said that he observed Tse losing $66 million in one night on the tables in Macau. $66 million in one night. Can you imagine that? If one is capable of losing 66 million in a night and not be too bothered, there's plenty of reason for more investigation. Who was this man and how did he become so rich? Investigators doubled down and were determined to find out who exactly this ultra-rich mystery man was. After many more observations, police suspected Tse Shilop of being a major trafficker of meth and heroin, as well as ecstasy into the United States and Australia, among other countries. Though, they still had yet to realize the entire scope of his organization. In the morning of the 15th of November, 2016, Kai Zheng Ze was on his way back home to Taiwan. While walking through the Myanmar airport, Kai seemed nervous, alert, and kept picking at his blistered hands. His entire demeanor aroused suspicion. It led to Kai being stopped and searched. Police found 80 grams of ketamine on him, taped to his thighs. His hands were bad because he had been handling drugs. These drugs are very toxic, an official said. Despite being tipped by the DEA about Kai, airport police said they were lucky to catch Kai. He basically snitched on himself by being so nervous. Kai refused to speak, and police decided to go through his phone. On his phone, they found a video of a crying man that was tied up, surrounded by three members of a triad who did some unfriendly things to him, so to say. The man in question allegedly threw 300 kilos of meth overboard from a boat because he thought a law enforcement boat was nearing in. The video was sent to people like Kai as a reminder not to play stupid games or be disloyal. Kai did not have just one phone in his possession though, he had another one. This phone would be called an Aladdin's Cave of Intel by a police commander. The phone had incredible amounts of photos, videos, logs of phone conversations, and thousands of texts related to drug smuggling. After puzzling a lot of the content together, it led police to an address in Yangon in Myanmar an address where a company packaged loose leaf Chinese tea. Remember how Tse Syndicate preferred to smuggle their drugs? Two days after Kai's arrest, Myanmar police decided to raid the address. They hit the jackpot. They found 622 kilograms of ketamine and 1,100 kilos of crystal meth, among other drugs. Kai was confronted with the news, yet still did not dare to speak. 
Meanwhile, police were still going through his phone meticulously. While looking through the pictures on his phone, an investigator suddenly jumped up. He noticed a familiar face in a picture. It was Tse Shi Lop. He recognized his face after being involved in the observation of Tse back in 2013. Kai's phone was later shared with law enforcement agencies all over the world, where Tse might have smuggled his drugs to. Australian, Chinese, Japanese, and New Zealand police forces all took their turns on inspecting the content. They were able to tie large shipments to one group, the one Kai was working for. Prior to this revelation, they thought it was done by multiple groups. That wasn't the case. This was all Tse Shi Lop and his enormous organization. It was dubbed as a mega syndicate by a Chinese anti-narcotics agency. Further investigation showed that the epicenter of the syndicate's production shifted from China to Shan State in Myanmar in the last few years. China provided the syndicate with easy access to important ingredients, but not the freedom to produce on a large enough scale without law enforcement interference. Myanmar did provide the syndicate this freedom to produce without being bothered by law enforcement. Guarded by rebel groups, Tse's syndicate has the ultimate freedom to produce there. Materials and workers were picked up in high-end SUVs and brought to their facility. Everyone knew what was going on, though no one spoke on it, because doing so would bring you in serious danger, and you would not want to go against Tse Shi Lop. The Asia-Pacific retail market for meth is estimated to be worth 30.3 to $61.4 billion annually. With its costs being relatively low, no need for an extensive labor force and high price per kilo, the revenues were unbelievably high. It is estimated by the UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, that he would produce one kilo in his Myanmar super labs for approximately $1,800 per kilo. The average retail price per kilo in Thailand would be $70,000, $300,000 in Australia, and $588,000 in Japan. In Japan, that would mean a markup for over 300 times. If Tse lost 10 tons and just one shipment went through, he would still have made a huge profit. That's why he could offer those replacements for lost shipments so easily. The UNODC further estimated that Tse's meth revenue alone was $8 billion a year in 2018, but could be as high as $18 billion. His syndicate would also have a 40% to 70% share of the entire wholesale market. The numbers are insane if you let that sink in. Experts have compared Tse's syndicates to Latin American cartels, suggesting it was just as big or sometimes even bigger. Tse Shilop is in the League of El Chapo or maybe Pablo Escobar, said Jeremy Douglas, Southeast Asia and Pacific representative for the United Nations Office on Drugs. The word kingpin often gets thrown around, but there is no doubt it applies here. Compared to Latin American cartels, Tse syndicate operates transnational. It is enormously wealthy, well-disciplined and sophisticated. As mentioned earlier, Tse did a very good job showing others that there was a lot of money to be made for everyone. It also supplies a bigger, more dispersed drug market and collaborates with a diverse range of local crime groups, which causes less uncontrolled outbreaks. They function like a global corporation with seamless efficiency, an anti-drugs official said. The experts also compared the personas of, for example, El Chapo or Pablo Escobar to Tse Shi Lop. Where El Chapo and Pablo were very famous and extremely violent, Tse is discreet and unknown. What do you think? Is he bigger than El Chapo or Pablo Escobar? Let me know in the comments. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Tse has had some struggles too. In February 2018, one of his super labs in Myanmar was raided by the police. More than 200,000 liters of chemicals were seized, as well as 10,000 kilograms of caffeine and 73,550 kilograms of sodium hydroxide, all substances needed for production. That same year, several senior members of his were arrested. In addition to these arrests, small labs that were used to experiment with new recipes were also raided. To make matters worse, the seizures of his shipments went up significantly too, while the prices of his drugs fell. But Tse would not be Tse if he would not come up with new ways to smuggle his drugs. He rerouted his deliveries and even started deploying hordes of Laotians who would carry 30 kilograms of drugs in a backpack across borders for him. However, the heat was on. Law enforcement in Australia went after Tse and wanted to arrest him as soon as possible. They were done with him flooding their country with his drugs. For years on end, they searched. Tse himself was aware that he was being hunted down and moved with precaution. That makes it all the more interesting 
that completely out of nowhere, the news broke that one of the world's biggest kingpins was arrested at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands on the 22nd of January 2021. What was Tsei, indeed one of the world's biggest kingpins, doing at Schiphol Airport as a regular passenger? Well, he wanted to catch a flight from Taiwan to Canada and had a layover in Amsterdam. Unfortunately for him, he would not make it to Canada anymore. Tsei fought against being extradited to Australia, but was still sent there in December 2022. Many questions arose when I read this. Why would he take this regular flight alone with a stopover? He should have had enough money and power to arrange a private jet, right? Well, the answer to these questions, we will probably never know. After being arrested once and being let off easily, it seemed as if Tsei was ready to double down on his efforts to become a major player in the drug business. He professionalized his business and made himself billions of dollars. Out of all the possible ways of his story ending, no one probably expected it to be at Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands while he was getting ready for his layover to Canada.